24 hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Very good afternoon. You're watching The Briefing PM, an hour of the latest political news, debate and analysis here on GB News. I'm Derek McCaffrey. Here's what's coming up between now and four o'clock. We'll get the latest from our Home Affairs and Security Editor, Mark White, as Ali Harbi Ali has been found guilty of murdering the MP David Amos. We'll be looking at that hideous terrorist attack on British soil. Also, we'll be in Paris, where there's going to be a rerun of the 2017 elections as Emmanuel Macron faces off against Marine Le Pen. We'll be looking at who could come out on top in less than two weeks' time. And we'll be in Berlin to discuss how the Austrian Chancellor's visit to Moscow, try and convince Vladimir Putin to stop the war of aggression in Ukraine, has gone down. Some Ukrainians have already branded it an appalling decision. As always, we also want to hear from you on the programme. To get in touch, you can email me at gbnews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. But before all of that, here's the news with Rosie at the top of the hour. Good afternoon. It's just one minute past three. I'm Rosie Wright here to get you up to date on GB News. As we've just been hearing, Ali Harbi Ali has been found guilty of murdering Sir David Amos. The 26-year-old repeatedly stabbed the Conservative MP in his Essex constituency last October. It took the jury just 18 minutes to return a unanimous verdict. He was also found guilty of preparing acts of terrorism. Harbi Ali is due to be sentenced on Wednesday. Detective Superintendent Dominic Murphy says the murder was an attack on democracy. The plan was formed over many, many years. Um, and so he is the, exactly the type of uh, terrorist that we and the police and our partners need to try and focus our efforts to disrupt and, and, uh, and arrest and prevent acts of terrorism from. The two unarmed police officers who tackled Sir David's murderer have been given an award for bravery. Essex police say PC Ryan Curtis and PC Scott James were awarded the Merit Star in a private ceremony in November. Now, in international news, a meeting between the Austrian Chancellor and the Russian President is reportedly currently underway in Moscow. It's the first time an EU leader has held face-to-face -face talks with Vladimir Putin since the war started. Ukraine is bracing for a new attack in the east, with President Zelensky warning Russia is readying tens of thousands of troops for the next offensive. New videos also emerged showing the extent of damage at the National Theatre in Maripol, which was destroyed during an airstrike killing at least 300 people. And there can be no hope that Russia will simply stop on its own. And there can be no hope that reason will prevail and the Russian authorities will simply refuse to continue this war. Russia can only be forced to do so, can only be forced to seek peace be forced to stop torturing people, be forced to respect the independent life of the neighbouring nations, be forced to leave the territory of Ukraine. The Prime Minister's spokeswoman says Boris Johnson has agreed to the Chancellor's request of an independent review of his finances. Well, it's after it emerged that Rishi Sunak held a US green card while he was in office and that his wife holds non-domicile status, which has significant tax implications. Well, Rishi Sunak says he followed the rules and hopes the review will provide further clarity. The Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, says the timing of the revelations couldn't be worse. At the very time, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, when everybody is feeling the pinch, and last week the government said we're going to put up tax on working people, we now discover that members of the Cabinet have been using schemes to reduce their own tax. It's very, very straightforward. It's a, a real sense of, of fairness and transparency here that's in play. From today, millions of people in the UK will see their state pensions rise. But it won't be enough to match the growing cost of living. 
pensions and universal credit benefits have increased by 3.1% today. But the Office for Budget Responsibility says inflation could hit a 40-year high of 8.7% later this year. Lorry drivers who are staging a protest in Dublin are being fined for blocking main roads to the port. They're demonstrating against fuel prices and the drivers shut off a toll bridge. They threaten to bring a complete lockdown to the city. They're also demanding the resignation of the Transport Minister, Eamon Ryan. In France now, and Emmanuel Macron is going to face Marine Le Pen in the second round of the presidential election. Both were seen back on the campaign trail in northern France and Paris today. Well, the incumbent president and his far-right rival came out on top in Sunday's first round vote. That's set up now a repeat of their 2017 runoff. A number of polls are predicting, though, that Macron will win, but with a tight margin. All the major candidates in the election, bar one, have called for tactical voting now against Le Pen. Pakistan's new prime minister-elect says he wants good ties with Europe. Shabazz Sharif, who was the opposition leader, is expected to remain in power until the general election in August next year. He was elected after Imran Khan was ousted as prime minister in a vote of no confidence yesterday. The move triggered protests across the country. The Queen has revealed she was left very tired and exhausted during her bout of coronavirus in February. The monarch made a video call to Royal London Hospital this week and she sympathised with a former Covid patient who'd lost his brother and father to the illness. You're now up to date. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now, let's head back to Darren for this afternoon's briefing. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rosie. It is six minutes past three o'clock. You're watching us on TV, online and on your radio. Very good afternoon. Thank you for your company on this Monday. We're going to start with the major breaking news story today, and that is in the last couple of hours, a man has been convicted at the Old Bailey of the murder of the Conservative MP, Sir David Amos, Ali Harvey. Ali, aged 26, stabbed Amos to death on the 15th of October last year, fuelled by Islamic State propaganda and having spent at least two years searching through various MPs with the intention to murder. In the last few minutes, the Prime Minister has tweeted this response, saying that Sir David Amos was a beloved colleague, public servant and friend who championed the city of Southend in everything he did. My thoughts today remain with Julia, the Amos family and all those who knew and loved him. Well, joining me now from outside the Old Bailey is our Home Affairs and Security Editor, uh, Mark White. Uh, Mark, it, it didn't take, unsurprisingly, very long for the jury to reach their verdict today. No, I have to say this was the quickest jury deliberation of any trial I've ever sat through, and I've sat through many over the years. Just 18 minutes after the jury was sent out to begin its deliberations, they were back in the courtroom, courtroom number two here at the Old Bailey, to pass those two guilty verdicts, guilty of preparing acts of terrorism and guilty of the murder of Sir David Amos. Now, Ali Harby Ali had denied murder. He claimed, although he admitted that he stabbed the MP to death, that that was somehow justified, that he was trying to protect fellow Muslims, that the reason that he had attacked Sir David Amos was because of his voting record on subjects such as the Iraq, uh, I should say, the war in Syria, and in particular that vote uh, to allow the bombing of Syria and cities like Aleppo. He was Ali Harbi Ali, an avowed Islamic State supporter who, we're told, had been planning a terrorist attack for some five years. He had a number of politicians in his sights. But in the end, as I've been looking back on, he decided on a much-loved and highly respected local MP who was always accessible to his constituents. Yes, we'd say I will wait. Outside this Baptist church in Leon C, the first police arrived to reports of a horrific stabbing. They say he's got a knife and he's just stabbed off. He's got a knife, but he's allowing you to go in a seat and hook the young lady. Lying critically wounded inside the church, local MP Sir David Amos. At the same time, we've got a taser unit one minute away, so we're going to go in and hook the taser unit. Just moments earlier, frantic 999 calls for help. Please, please call. 
quick now. The man is wielding a knife. Um, he's yeah. telling me he's, Where are he's you? killed. He's, he's killed David Amos at Belfast Methodist Church. With the attackers still inside, the unarmed officers decide they have to push forward. Mate, drop the knife. Drop, drop the knife now! Get it down! With the attackers subdued, medics were finally able to reach the stricken MP. But Sir David died at the scene, having suffered more than 20 stab injuries. As he was booked into custody, terrorist Ali Harbi Ali openly admitted his motivation. Domestic or hate related in Terror. Anyway. Pardon? Terror. Earlier, CCTV captured him leaving his London home, heading for Sir David's regular constituency surgery. In his rucksack, the 12-inch long murder weapon. When I first came in, okay. came to her. Yeah. Despite denying murder in court, in police interviews, the 26-year-old was more candid. Mr. Ali, is this a terrorist attack? I mean, I guess, yeah. I killed an MP and I've done it. Yeah. Okay. Ali showed the first signs of radicalisation in 2014 and was briefly referred to counter-extremism programmes. It's a reflection of the challenge we face in counter-terrorism today. So after 16 years as a counter-terrorism detective, the threat has diversified significantly. And if an individual is going to sit at home on their own conducting research and not tell anyone else about their case, that's part of the challenge that we face. Um, but we do that with the family of those that have been radicalised, with, pub with the public, to take every attempt to disrupt and detect terrorism where we can. Ali had been planning an attack for at least five years before he finally struck, scoping out a number of potential victims, including Cabinet Minister Michael Gove, even writing down possible methods of attack, like targeting him during his morning jog. Fellow Cabinet Minister Dominic Raab and Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer were also in his sights. South End no should way. be the city of Colorado. In the end, he settled on Sir David Amos, an easy target always accessible to his constituents. David was a very special person and that is why there's been such a deep feeling of tragedy after his murder. Uh, this was no ordinary MP, this was someone who was completely dedicated to his job. Uh, and to lose someone like that, I think it's affected us all. It's certainly affected me very badly. That feeling of profound loss was felt most keenly in Sir David's constituency, where locals developed a deep respect for a politician who dedicated much of his time to campaigning for South End to gain city status. That mission completed posthumously. As he begins life behind bars, Sir David's killer has never shown any remorse for the murder of a much-loved and deeply respected Member of Parliament. Mark White, GB News. Now it is very likely that Ali Harbi Ali will be given a whole life tariff. In other words, he will spend the rest of his life behind bars because he has also been found guilty of preparing acts of terrorism. So this was a murder carried out in pursuit of terrorist aims and that, as is normal, would carry a whole life tariff. He is back here this coming Wednesday for sentencing. Uh, and Mark, just to focus just finally on the police officers involved in this, in your uh, incredible report, we obviously saw that body cam coverage, didn't we? Uh, as they turned up, they've subsequently received a, a medal, but they turned up, uh, frankly, unarmed themselves, purely with, with, with batons, maybe with CS uh, spray, but they went into a very, very dangerous uh, situation. Yes, not surprising that they are being awarded for their bravery in uh, tackling this knife man just minutes after arriving on scene, despite the fact that they were only armed uh, with the ASP, this extendable baton and some CS spray, so not having the benefits of taser stun guns or indeed uh, firearms uh, from an armed response unit because, of course, this is a force like Essex. It's the same situation in so many of the provincial forces around the country. It's not like central London or central Birmingham uh, 
where you would have an armed response unit really within a minute or two of any location in the centre of these big cities. You don't have that when you get out to uh, the regions and uh, smaller towns and cities. So the first police officers on scene are often the unarmed officers who have to make that decision. Do they push forward, put themselves in danger, um, or do they wait? And of course, they knew that there was someone who had been stabbed multiple times, was lying in that church, critically injured, and they decided to push forward to confront the attacker, to try to save a life. In the end, there was nothing they could do for Sir David Amos, having been stabbed more than 20 times. But their bravery, nonetheless, will be recognised. Um, OK, uh, Mark White, as always, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Mark White there, our Home Affairs and Security Editor outside the Old Bailey. Let's move on, because the Prime Minister has earned plaudits, it must be said, over the weekend from across the political spectrum for his surprise visits to meet the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Saturday. The Prime Minister was pictured walking through the worn toward streets of Kyiv with President Zelensky. Boris Johnson was greeted warmly uh, by citizens there who thanked him and indeed all of us for their efforts in attempting to combat Russian aggression. It comes as British and American intelligence are now warning that a Russian assault in the Donbass region is imminent and that further bloodshed is inevitable. Well, joining me now from Kyiv to discuss all of this is the Ukrainian member of parliament, Kira Radak, uh, who is, uh, as you can see, in the Ukrainian capital. Uh, Kira, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, just how important do you think it it was. We saw Ursula von der Leyen, the EU Commission president in Ukraine on Friday, uh, that Western leaders are prepared to, to go uh, to Ukraine uh, in a show of solidarity. Hello, thank you so much for having me. The solidarity is important. The leadership is even more important. So we applaud uh, to the uh, visits of the leaders, and we uh, consider them very uplifting for Ukrainian people. Because though the whole world is saying we cheer for Ukraine, we support Ukraine, when we look at the facts, we see that there is no unity in the sanctions that are being voted for. Uh, they have many loopholes. And as of right now, we still did not get the heavy weaponry that we requested. So we are looking for the ones who can step up and say, I'm the leader, I will be championing getting Ukraine what Ukraine needs. And we see Premier Boris Johnson and we see Ursula von der Leyen, we, we see them being those leaders, being those champions of uh, uh, united support to Ukraine. So uh, the results of uh, uh, Boris Johnson's visit is Ukraine is getting more armored vehicles and we are getting more uh, weapons. And this is great. But what we need is somebody to uh, get the European countries uh, on this, to the same track. Because uh, as I said, for the last month, European countries have paid Russia $35 billion for gas and oil. The total aid of the whole world to Ukraine is less than a billion. So, like, when we are talking about weight, <laughs> uh, like, who is supporting who then? Because with uh, this amount of cash going in, Russia will be able to afford one or more or two more wars uh, at this rate. And the whole world will be supporting Ukraine and cheering for us. But without the real effective sanctions, uh, it will be just looking how we are getting killed and watching the bloodshed that's, that happened in Bucha, that happened in Borodyanka, and that is going to happen in Donbass right now. And how do you feel about uh, the Austrian chancellor, who was also in Kyiv on Saturday, uh, or certainly over the weekend, but is now in Moscow today meeting uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, do you think that's a sensible uh, thing for the Austrian chancellor to do, if it does help potentially bring an end uh, to the war? So let me paint you this picture. At the same time, when the so-called peaceful negotiations were conducted, from Russian side, Ukrainian side, and with the help of Turkey and European countries. At the same time, people in Bucha were tortured and killed by Russian soldiers. It was not like discoordinated. It was intentional because Russia does not want to get 
peace treaty. Russia wants to fight. Russia actually wants to conquer Ukraine and to conquer Poland and Baltic countries. And they, they were very blunt about it. So every negotiation that is happening with Russia is usually the attempt to gain political gains inside the country of the leader who is trying to do so. We have seen this with Macron, who was playing uh, uh, um, playing like both sides, saying, I support Ukraine, but I'm also discussing it with Putin. No result. Hopefully it helped Macron uh, at these elections. Same thing happens with every single person who is trying to get in contact with Putin. Everybody knows that it's useful, useless, but it probably uh, gives people uh, some uplifting inside the country. Look. Biden is not trying to get an agreement with Putin. Boris Johnson is not trying to get an agreement with Putin. They don't lie to themselves. They know that it's useless. They know that he made a decision to push to the Third World War and that he will be doing that. But, but, and that, I think, is an honest way for the leaders, for the politicians to, um, to go about that. When yeah, they say, I, yeah, we have no point I, 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 I get I get that uh, point here, but at the same time, President Zelensky, your president, has said he is willing uh, to meet with President Putin. In the end, the only way this war is going to come to an end it is what, through negotiation, through compromise, isn't it? Well, the saying were before we have seen what happened in Bucha, before we have seen what happened in Borodyanka. Right now, I don't think Ukrainian people will, will accept any kind of negotiations with Russians. After what we have seen, the atrocities, raped women, raped children, uh, destroyed homes, destroyed houses, uh, mines inside the people's apartments, uh, um, like all, even the kitchen, uh, kitchen re, uh, supplies taken away and looted by Russians. It's just, you know, it's just inhumane what is happening there. And I don't think that uh, after this, there will be any acceptance inside the Ukrainian nation on the peace treaty. Look at what happened after we told our people to get away from, from the East to evacuate. Russians hit uh, the train station where elderly and children were trying to evacuate. Like, what kind of peace are we talking after that? Yeah. It's not that they did it unintentionally. Their intention was to kill as many civilians as possible. Their intention was to uh, uh, to beat where it hurts. Okay. So how how is it even, like, what is the end game and the result here that we can anticipate? I don't think okay. that there is any. We will be fighting. Okay. okay. I uh, really appreciate your thoughts, uh, as always, uh, Kia. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Kia Rodak there, who is a uh, MP in the Ukrainian parliament, making clear uh, that she does not think uh, the EU and the West uh, should be giving money uh, to the Russians still for oil and gas, or indeed, least of all, going to see Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin. We'll be talking about that visit a little later on in the programme. We'll get a quick break, though, here on GB News. Uh, coming up, uh, we're going to be in Paris, in France. Uh, for the presidential election, Marine Le Pen versus Emmanuel Macron. Could the far right win out in two weeks' time? We'll be discussing that after we bring you up to date with the weather on this Monday afternoon. Hello again, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Warmer and drier weather is on the way for many of us this weekend. But for the time being, it's cloudy out there, it's breezy, and there is some rain or showers to talk about. Low pressure at the moment controlling things and that's sitting out towards the southwest. Ahead of that low, weather fronts are moving in. Now, these are generally showery features, but, uh, well, could bring some more persistent rain at times to Northern Ireland, central and southern Scotland, northern England. Even more so as we head through the night, an area of rain enlarging across eastern Scotland with some persistent wet weather here. And then further showers move up from the near continent with the odd rumble of thunder for Wales in the southwest. But it's a mild night, 10 to 12 Celsius in the south, 5 to 6 further north. Frost-free start to Tuesday for virtually everyone. But a gloomy start, a lot of low cloud, mistiness out there. Areas of rain moving north so that by the afternoon, it's much of central and eastern Scotland, northern and eventually central and eastern England that sees the more persistent weather. Further west and further southwest, brighter skies, some sunny spells coming through and... 17 or 18 Celsius, but a few showers will break out uh, even in the west and the southwest by the afternoon and early evening.
The more persistent wet weather, though, eases away from eastern and northern England. It sticks around for eastern Scotland, pushing into the Northern Isles by the end of Tuesday night. Clear spells for some further south, but a lot of cloud cover. And again, some mist and murk, particularly around western and southern shores. So a gloomy start to Wednesday for many, and a damp start there for the far north and northeast of Scotland. One or two showers as we begin things, but through the day on Wednesday, skies brighten, the sun comes through, and we'll see more widely scattered showers breaking out. Thursday, many places dry away from the far west. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighboring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Uh, very welcome back to GB News. Now, the French President Emmanuel Macron and his far-right rival Marine Le Pen will be in a runoff uh, for the presidential election in just under two weeks' time. President Macron faced criticism for not campaigning in the final weeks before the first round of voting yesterday, but managed to gain 27.6% of the vote, which is more than he got five years ago in the first round. However, the far-right leader of the national rally, Marine Le Pen, also did pretty well, again, getting more than she did five years ago at 23.4%. And it sets a rematch of 2017 with Emmanuel Macron when he emerged triumphant in a landslide victory. It's looking a hell of a lot closer this time round. Let's bring in our regular Paris contributor, top man Peter Allen, who is joining us uh, down the line. Peter, very good afternoon to you. We were talking on Thursday, weren't we, about what we expected. Uh, were you surprised, um, first of all, by the, the two frontrunners last night? Uh, as I said, they, they both did uh, better than they did five years ago. Yes, they were both uh, up 
in the ratings. Uh, both are very pleased with their scores. Excellent uh, first round scores for both of them. And uh, of course, it means they're going to progress into the second round. Uh, Marine Le Pen was challenged by Jean-Luc uh, Mélenchon, the far left candidate. And uh, he started to sort of creep up towards her vote um, as the evening went on, but he couldn't catch her. So uh, third time, uh, could be third time lucky for Marine Le Pen. She's uh, very, very happy indeed. Her supporters, uh, as we can see in the pictures there, are absolutely delighted. She has nationwide appeal. And uh, she thinks that the country is sick and tired of uh, Emmanuel Macron and that uh, she can replace him uh, in two weeks' time. One of the notable things from last night, Peter, was actually how well uh, the far left uh, did. I mean, uh, he, he could have ended up in the final two with, with a couple of more votes, effectively. Yes, this is one of the extraordinary things uh, about France and something a lot of people who don't spend too much time here don't really realise. But the, the, the far left, the left certainly, is, is hugely popular across France. Uh, a lot of people instinctively have socialist ideas. And uh, if you look at um, the, all the, the different uh, parts of the left, all the different parties and individual standing with left-wing ideas, if you put them all together, they would comfortably um, get through the second round and quite possibly win the whole thing. And yet year after year, they fail to unite. Uh, the last uh, socialist administration, not that long ago, it was Francois Hollande, uh, he held them all together for five years, but then his party completely collapsed when he did. Uh, he was um, he lost uh, in 2017, or he, he it stopped being um, president in 2017 anyway, and then Emmanuel Macron, who was in his government, but not, I have to say, as a socialist. He was uh, a senior civil servant, really. But um, again, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, huge vote, massive vote last night, millions and millions of people across the country, especially the young. A lot of very, very young people are drawn to left-wing politics. And of course, Mélenchon is an extremist, many would argue. He's anti-capitalist. He's anti the Fifth Republic. He doesn't believe in the system of government here. He'd love to see that uh, pulled apart. And yet he gets this enormous vote. If he'd just got a little bit of more support for, for example, the Socialist Party here, he'd be through. Indeed. And the big question now, of course, is what happens over the next couple of weeks? Where are those votes from Mélenchon uh, go? And also uh, Zamor, who uh, didn't do very well in the end, but got 7%. What, what's your thought about how uh, those voters, where they will, they will turn to? Well, officially, you'd think that most of, for example, the Mélenchon supporters would listen to the Mélenchon. He has said don't vote Macron. That's it. Uh, he hasn't said, sorry, I beg your pardon, he said don't vote Le Pen. Uh, he hasn't said um, don't vote Macron. That doesn't mean his supporters will uh, vote for Macron. A lot of them potentially will abstain, for example. Um, some will join what uh, is uh, known as the Republican Front. This is uh, people of all political persuasions getting together, to, to fight extremism. That's how it's, uh, it's framed, uh, this idea. Uh, other parties, including the socialists, again, they only got 1.7% last night, so they're not hugely important, but they've been told by their candidate and Hidalgo to vote for uh, Macron. And uh, the Conservative Party here, the Gaullist Conservatives, who are in an appalling state. Uh, this is the party that for years has been the equivalent of the British Conservative Party, they're currently called the Republicans. They got less than 5% last night, which means they lost their deposit. They won't get their expenses paid. So they're now 7 million uh, euros in debt and have launched appeals to try and get that money back. But their candidate, uh, Valérie Pécresse, she has actually said to her uh, supporters, please vote uh, for Manuel Macron. So you've got that divide. The only other party that has uh, come out and said, uh, vote for Le Pen is Eric Zemmour. Uh, he's got a, a movement called Reconquest, and he's saying uh, inevitably uh, vote far right, and he's saying uh, uh, vote for Le Pen. It's going to be fascinating. Uh, two weeks. Uh, we will be talking a lot about that between now and then. Uh, Peter, as always, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Peter Allen there from Paris on the French elections. Uh, we're going to pause there on GB News and The Briefing. We'll be talking about Rishi Sunak, uh, Ukraine and other things in the next 30 minutes. But first, here's the news.
Good afternoon, it's 3.34. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. Ali Harvey Ali has been found guilty of murdering Sir David Amos. The 26-year-old repeatedly stabbed the Conservative MP in his Essex constituency last October. It took the jury just 18 minutes to return a unanimous verdict. He was also found guilty of preparing acts of terrorism. He's due to be sentenced on Wednesday. The two unarmed police officers who tackled Sir David's murderer have been given an award for bravery. Essex police say PC Ryan Curtis and PC Scott James were awarded the Merit Star in a private ceremony in November. The Austrian Chancellor says his meeting with Vladimir Putin in Moscow was direct, open and tough. It is the first time an EU leader has held face-to-face -face talks with Russia's president since the war started. In the meantime, Ukraine is bracing for a new attack in the east. With its president, Volodymyr Zelensky, warning Russia is readying tens of thousands of troops for the next offensive. New videos also emerged showing the extent of the damage at the National Theatre in Mariupol, which had been destroyed during an airstrike, killing at least 300 people. Boris Johnson's spokeswoman says the Prime Minister has agreed to the Chancellor's request of an independent review of his finances. It's after it emerged that Rishi Sunak held a US green card while in office and that his wife holds non-domicile status, which has significant tax implications. The Chancellor says he followed the rules and hopes the review will provide further clarity. Millions of people in the UK will see a rise in their state pension, but it won't be enough to match the growing cost of living. Pensions and universal credit benefits have increased by 3.1% today, but the Office for Budget Responsibility says inflation could hit a 40-year high of 8.7% later this year. You're up to date on GB News. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Darren for the briefing. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Uh, very welcome back to the briefing on this Monday afternoon. We're on TV, online and on your radio. It is 22 minutes to four o'clock. To get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, I got you very animated earlier about this story. That is, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has referred himself to the independent advisor on ministers' interests. In a letter to Lord Guy, he intends to clarify, he says, his wife's non-dom status. He had a US green card.
the latest scandal revelations about the Chancellor, saw him move his family out of number 11 over the weekend. And his response to the questions about his wife's tax affairs, again, it appears to have left people asking questions about his political nose, but also about his chances of succeeding Boris Johnson. It comes as Labour have accused the Sunak family of avoiding tens of millions of pounds in taxes. And we heard a little earlier today from Sukhya Stammer. Well, we know that the Chancellor's family appear to have used a scheme to reduce their tax. We now know that the former Chancellor uh, used a scheme to reduce his tax. Um, so whilst they're asking other people to pay more in tax, they seem to be involved in schemes to keep their own tax down. And this is now a pattern of behaviour. What I want from the Prime Minister is an assurance, an assurance as to whether other members of the Cabinet have been using these schemes to reduce their tax. And I think on behalf of everybody who's now paying more tax, we're entitled to an answer to that question. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer speaking earlier. Joining me now, John McTurnan. He's a former political secretary to Tony Blair. John, as always, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, he's got himself into a bit of a muddle, hasn't he, the Chancellor? Yeah, I think he has. I think he, he ignored the first rule of political scandals, which is do quickly what you're going to be made to do uh, at, over time. So he should have realised he couldn't push it away. He should simply have fronted up and gone, look, OK, uh, these are the facts. I'm sorry for them. I'm referring myself to uh, the, the to Lord Geit and my wife is changing her status from non-dom. If they'd done that quickly last week in one go and not had this whole period, you know, see our interviews, including the one in the sun saying, hands off my wife as if he's Will Smith or something. I think you have to take a very calm, calm position on this thing. Do it quickly, do it cleanly and do it once. Don't keep on redefining. It seems he seems shiftier the more he keeps saying, I'm drawing a line under it. Oh, no, I'll do the next, next thing. I'll draw a line under it. Oh, no, I'll do another thing. So he should have done one thing, uh, one big thing last week, and he's paying for that. And is that why you think some Conservative MPs, and we heard this over the weekend, were essentially questioning his political antennae that he didn't see this coming, especially when it comes to things like the green card as well? Oh, uh, well, look, I think, yeah, I think um, there's a thing that sometimes people... Um, believe in what they hope for. I mean, Rishi must have hoped he could get through his political career, keep his green card, get through his political career, his wife stay non-dom. Non um, never, ever take advice from yourself. Ask other people in politics. Politics should be uh, entered into in a sceptical way, not cynical, but a good advisor would have said, I know you want that, Rishi, but you can't. You know, the best advisors say no, minister. They don't say yes, minister. And I think he's taken bad advice. And all of this goes to his judgment, because in the end, leaders, which is what he aspires to be, prime ministers, which is what he aspires to be, they make many decisions every day. And it's the quality of the judgment that they bring to bear, the political judgment they bring to bear, which is the essential thing. So, you know, Boris Johnson, whatever you think about him, has a connection with the public and he has a way of, of, of advancing uh, on certain topics and challenges. In this situation, Rishi Sunak seems over a period of time to have made really bad political decisions. The obvious one being, uh, the spring statement, which all it had in it was a tax cut in a couple of years' time. It seemed to be the, the, the tinnest of years. Uh, the, you know, the, the will unwillingness to engage with where the public really are and how the cost of living crisis is biting now. And so this scandal around him, around his wife and all of these questions, this is tailor-made for, for now when, when ordinary people are feeling pressure and they look and they go, oh, it's not like that for you, is it? Um, well, not like that yeah. at all. Now, and doesn't John, to a large degree, that that allude to a wider question that people have been debating in the last week or so about whether Rishi Sunak is is almost too wealthy to be prime minister? That under our political system, we we just don't like it when people are in not just the top one percent, but the top zero point zero zero one percent. Well, look, we've got a cabinet full of wealthy people. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is their policy decisions. The problem is universal credit's been cut. It doesn't matter whether Rishi Sunak uh, is moderately well off uh, or comes from a working class background. His dad was a minor. I mean, uh, Sajid Javid is always telling us about his, his background. His dad, a bus conductor, a bus driver. Um, you know, it doesn't matter uh, where you come from, what your status is, what are the decisions that you are making doing to ordinary people. And that, that, that takes you back to, you know, people have been saying about Partygate, one rule for them, another one for us. 
the most dangerous place to be in British politics is to be seen by the voters as being out of touch. And this does feel like out of touch behavior. Uh, it may suit the prime minister to have a wounded, a badly wounded and damaged, politically damaged chance. A good for the country. More oh, we seem to be losing John there. Um, I think we have lost him. But we got the general gist of what he had to say in regards to all of that. Um, as I say, the uh, big discussions have been taking place over the last week or so in political circles about that connection with wealth. John seemed to suggest it wasn't the case. Uh, John, just before we let you go, and uh, I think the, the lines reconnect it now, um, I, 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 I asked that question about, about wealth because some of the criticism is about how could he understand how ordinary people live given He's come from a wealthy background and is in a wealthy background. But additionally, I suppose, what happens now? Does, does the Prime Minister keep him in situ, uh, as you seem to be suggesting? Or does potentially he just walk away and think, actually, this politics is not worth the hassle? Well, look, for all politicians, that, that's the decision. Uh, do you take the public pressure? Do you only like it when the job is easy? when people love you, or do you, you know, take the thick with the thin? I think if Rishi Sunak aspires to be the Prime Minister, if he aspires to be in politics long term, he should stay. And if he actually doesn't like this, that, you, know, you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Uh, he shouldn't wait till the, the next election. He should leave now uh, and give the Prime Minister a fair go of having a Chancellor who's actually up to the um, rough and tumble of politics. As always, John, appreciate your analysis. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, John McTurner there. Uh, joining us down the line, apologies for the slight glitch. Now, let's move on and move back, that is, to Ukraine, because the Austrian Chancellor Colin Hammer has met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow in a bid to build bridges between Russia and Ukraine and to stop what he is branded the war of aggression. It was the first face-to-face -face meeting that we've seen between Mr Putin and an EU leader since the Russian invasion began at the end of February. It comes as over the weekend the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky took indirect aim at the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz as well as Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban stating, we know who is constantly trying to soften sanction proposals but I'm confident that both these politicians and these countries will change the position under the pressure of all that Russia is doing against Ukrainians. Well, joining up, uh, as always, a good friend of the channel, uh, is our German reporter, Thomas Sparrow, in Berlin. Thomas, very good afternoon uh, to you. First of all, let's focus on uh, the Austrian Chancellor's visit. Some Ukrainians have branded it appalling. What, what's the thought on the Austrian side about why they feel the need to go to the Kremlin? There has definitely been a lot of criticism regarding this visit, and especially by those who think that the Austrian Chancellor should have learned from the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, and from the French President, Emmanuel Macron, who before the war actually went to Moscow and met with Putin, but were not able to change his mind at all. So there has certainly been some criticism in that regard, and not only, by the way, by Ukrainians. Yet at the same time, there are others who believe that this visit could be particularly important to build those channels of communication. In fact, it has been welcomed also by the German Chancellor. And what is particularly important or interesting here is the fact that Austria plays a significant role in all this, on the one hand being a member of the European Union, on the other hand having also close ties to Russia, which could also be problematic because they have a particularly big dependence on Russian energy. But yet, at the same time, Austria is militarily neutral. And there has been a lot of comparison in recent weeks about that idea of Ukraine becoming a neutral country and the possibility of Ukraine assuming a sort of similar role to what Austria has had. So from that perspective, this visit is seen as something that could be potentially important. So there you have both perspectives. Those who criticize it very clearly by saying that this shouldn't happen. Those, on the other hand, who see it as potentially beneficial to try and have those bridges of communication. Uh, what's the view from, from Berlin? I was there a couple of weeks ago and um, there was a lot of Ukrainian flags around, a lot of hashtag solidarity with Ukraine. But clearly President Zelensky doesn't feel that when you talk about the German administration. His argument that Germany's one of the drags on trying to increase sanctions, is that fair? Well, Zelensky has on various occasions criticised Germany and in particular asked the German government to do 
much more. Yet at the same time, it's also important to stress that Zelensky has, and he did that very recently as well, recognize that Germany has moved a long way since the beginning of the war. There has been a remarkable foreign and defense policy shift here in Germany when it comes to sending weapons to Ukraine, when it comes to increasing defense expenditure, when it comes to supporting certain sanctions. And yet, you're right when you point out that in some cases, Germany has been rather reluctant to accept, to accept even further sanctions coming from the EU, in particular when it comes to an oil or gas embargo, or when it touches any element of that energy sector, which is particularly important for Russia, but also particularly important for Germany. Germany is, to a large extent, dependent on Russian energy. It has reduced that dependency in the last few weeks, but it is still large enough for German officials to be concerned that a potential embargo on gas or on oil could not only harm Russia, but it could affect Germany very seriously when it comes to mass unemployment, poverty, recession, increased inflation, and so on. So that's why when you talk to German officials, they are always reluctant to impose that embargo or to accept that idea of an embargo immediately. They say that they need to prepare themselves beforehand and they need to prepare Germany also beforehand. But those who criticize it say that Germany needs to act more quickly and more swiftly and that there is simply no time to prepare. OK, uh, Thomas, as always, I appreciate your time and your analysis this afternoon. Thomas Morrow there joining us from uh, Berlin. Now, let's stick with Ukraine, because a 19-year-old natural sciences student at the University of Cambridge says he's going to fight in Ukraine and has vowed to stay there until Ukraine wins. He's trained in Lviv for the past two weeks and will be returning on Friday. He says he wants to continue his studies remotely and take his exams from the front line if he has to. Well, I'd like to say we're joined by that student. He is Nikolai Nizilov, who joins us now. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Um, just give us a sense of why you've made uh, this decision uh, to go off and fight rather than remain at Cambridge. Well, it was quite a simple decision. I am Ukrainian. I might not be by nationality, but I am by culture. Uh, my school friends, my family members, they're fighting on the front lines and I want to join them. Uh, the streets that I walked out as a kid, they're now littered with bodies. I just want to go see my friends, see them alive, go out for a beer, go out dancing in a vibrant country that is Ukraine. country with a beautiful culture that Putin is trying to wipe off the face of the earth. It's not really just a war. Russian soldiers are raping and mutilating children. It is a genocide. Indeed, it is you know, clearly a very, very desperate situation. But, you know, it, it's, it takes a lot of courage in many ways, but, you know, to go and to travel and... Uh, to fight, uh, potentially to, to be prepared to kill. Um, I mean, th that is a, it's a very, very... Was it a difficult decision to make? It was very simple. Uh, it, it's quite simple to spot when another country builds up 180,000 troops around your country, starts building military hospitals and stocking up on blood supplies. You kind of know what's going to happen. So I knew I was going weeks before the war started. And what, in terms of, you, you, you've just come back from there, haven't you? You were there, I think, uh, part of kind of being trained up, if you like, as a, yes. as a soldier. How was that? Uh, so I'm part of a specialist volunteer unit that builds and operates drones. Uh, I'm their medic and drone pilot. Um, we're a unit of nine. Uh, the drones that we operate, they can lift up to 15 kilos of humanitarian cargo and deliver it 20 kilometers away. Uh, this is specifically to deliver supplies to areas where humanitarian corridors could not be established due to Russians not obeying by international law. Uh, volunteers and medics that are trying to get to cities like Mariupol are getting executed on the way as they try to get in. This is where we come in, and that is why I'm raising funds for my own unit. Well, what have your parents said about all of this? Of course they don't want me to go. Uh, they're parents after all but they do completely understand why I made that decision. And your expectation is that you're going to go back on, on Friday. Um, you, I should do. I'm buying the cars that we need for our unit now, and as soon as I got them, I can leave and head for Ukraine. Uh, quite extraordinary stuff. And, and, and you know, you, 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 as you say, you still got friends there. Um, you're fighting on behalf of your, 
uh, your, your country. Is it your expectation, is, though, that you could be there for quite a long period of time? Uh, are you scared at all, um, I suppose, is the question I'm asking. Well, of course you're scared. It, it, it's, it, it, it is a dangerous situation. It is war. Uh, I'm going there. There is a high risk, but... Ukrainians are strong people, and I believe together, if everybody contributes, we can definitely overcome the horrible aggression that is Russia. And as I say, you you got you are going out on on Friday, but you you don't know where initially, do you? Or no, the situation is so fluid right now that by the time we're finished, uh, we have finished equipping our unit, which is why I need all the donations I can get so we can buy all the equipment. Um, as soon as we have completed this, we'll be heading off towards the front lines, but we do not know where. Sorry. No, not at all. Uh, we'll take care. Um, a very brave decision in many regards. Um, and uh, as I say, the best of luck uh, to you. Could I just, like sorry, it. could I mention all the details for my fundraiser are on my Instagram and Facebook pages if you want to come and donate and share. Thank you. Okay, not at all. Nikolai, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us this afternoon. At the snack line. At Nizilov, who is travelling to Ukraine uh, later on this week uh, to fight on behalf of, he was there, the Ukrainian people. Uh, OK, let's just bring up to date with some of the views. You'll be getting in touch, GB views at gbnews.uk. Uh, Elizabeth says that your blur man, that was John McTurnan, is blaming the victim, uh, i.e. Rishi Sunak. This is a smear campaign made in time for the elections. Uh, Rob says, can the Labour commentators please explain why 13 years of government Labour didn't update uh, the rules. Uh, on the French election, Barry says goodbye, Macron. And Mike says Marine Le Pen is not far right. Uh, she is right wing or a conservative. She's not like Eric Zemmour. OK, that is it from me for uh, today. It would be remiss of me uh, not to wish my colleague and producer of this programme, Ryan, a happy birthday. I'm sure he's not going to remain sober for much of the rest of the afternoon. Up next is Colin Brazier with Brazier between four and six. But before all of that, Here's the latest weather. I'll see you tomorrow. Hello again. I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Warmer and drier weather is on the way for many of us this weekend. But for the time being, it's cloudy out there, it's breezy, and there is some rain or showers to talk about. Low pressure at the moment controlling things, and that's sitting out towards the southwest. Ahead of that low, weather fronts are moving in. Now, these are generally showery features, but, uh, well bring some more persistent rain at times to Northern Ireland, central and southern Scotland, northern England. Even more so as we head through the night, an area of rain enlarging across eastern Scotland will bring some persistent wet weather here. And then further showers move up from the near continent with the odd rumble of thunder for Wales in the southwest. But it's a mild night, 10 to 12 Celsius in the south, 5 to 6 further north, frost-free start to Tuesday for virtually everyone, but a gloomy start, a lot of low cloud mistiness out there, areas of rain moving north so that by the afternoon,